What's up, Brozones? Welcome back to the Ozone, and uh, welcome back to Summer Canophobia. This is part two of my audio book. I am very sorry that I'm going to have to do these, uh, the, the entirety of Summer Canophobia in parts. I just have, like, no time on my hands, so I have to do them in parts anyway, so I may as well upload them in parts so that I get them out to you quicker. Uh, anyway... Without further ado, let's get straight back into this. If you haven't seen my first part, then go and watch that, obviously. Anyway, after the ferry boats were closed off, Caden shut off the power to the mech aquarium and opened the tarp to the tank. He did his usual affirmations and breathing exercises as he put on the diving suit and the equipment. He walked around the tank several times, eyeing the clearest route to Polo. Um, book, let me do this, please. Okay, there we go. Uh, dang, if that serpent hadn't gotten itself in a tight corner. Caden figured if he kept close to the area that Polo lodged itself in, he'd be able to avoid the other animatronics. The closest ones to the serpent were Frank the Diver and Sly the Shark. Zeus was way on the other side of the tank. Now, if it made its way all the way round toward Caden this time... Wait. Oh, yeah, never mind. That I did say that right. I thought I said something wrong, but I said that right. He shook his head. No. The animatronics were powerless. Nothing moved on its own. What about Zeus? He'd thought about this. A lot. And had decided that by swimming around and causing the water to flow, the dragon had just probably floated with the current. Simple explanation. Caden sat down on the edge of the tank and set out a quick prayer. Uh, he slipped the breathing regulator into his mouth and slowly dipped into the cold water, his mind filling with distant static. He sank down and then swam toward the area where Polo was wedged. He avoided the diver. Its arms were floating out in front of it. Then Caden shifted to look at Sly. Of course, it appeared like the small shark was staring right at him again. Caden looked away and aimed for the rocks. There was a small space between the tank wall and the rocks that Caden could reach an arm through in order to fix Polo. Some of the rocks had real moss on them, and Caden wondered if he was keeping the levels of the chemicals strong enough to kill fungal growth. There were years of build-up of algae on the rocks and seashells. He'd advised Martin that the tank needed an expert cleaning, but his boss had shaken his head, worried about costs and downtime for the park. Caden slipped his arm through the rocks and unscrewed Polo's panel with one hand. It took some stretching and manoeuvring, but he finally managed it. He glanced up and eyed the animatronics. Frank had somehow shifted and was now looking down at him. The helmet's glass was tinted so dark that there was no animatronic face that could be seen. It felt like Frank was spying on him. Caden's pulse fluttered. Just hurry, he told himself. He checked Polo's wires by touch. Nothing felt loose. He stretched and flicked the reset button, snatching his arm back. Polo jerked so hard it hit the side of the rocks, breaking a piece of the scenery off. As always, Caden froze in panic until the serpent settled down. The piece of rock floated in front of him. But it seemed odd. Not like a rock at all. And rocks didn't float. Caden grabbed for it. It was weird, narrow, and discoloured with algae. Curious, he tucked the rock into his tool pouch. But suddenly he felt... odd. He blinked. His air supply had thinned. Was he having a panic attack? No, no, no. He was okay. He knew exactly where he was and what he was doing. And then his air supply was just gone. What the heck? He always filled his tanks up. How could he have run out of air? He'd forgotten to double-check the air level before putting it on, but he knew he didn't have to. He made sure it was always full after every dive. He didn't have a pressure gauge because the last one had been broken and Martin wouldn't replace it. He pulled the regulator from his mouth, shook it, and tried again. Nothing. He was definitely out of air. He pulled the breathing regulator out of his mouth, pressed his lips together, and quickly closed up Polo. He looked up to see the diver was even closer. Not again. Caden shoved off the rocks below to get to the top, but he was stuck. He looked down. A rip in his tool pouch had caught on a rigid seashell. He yanked at the pouch as trepidation washed over him. He tried to unclip the pouch at his belt, but the panic was setting in and he couldn't do it underwater. He needed air. He couldn't breathe. Darkness started to cloud his vision. He yanked fiercely and finally got himself free. He swam as fast as he could to the top. It felt like his chest was about to explode. He felt the diver's arm brush against him, and he shoved it away, kicking his legs. He burst out of the top and sucked in air like a human vacuum. 
He gagged so hard it felt like something was clawing up his throat. His face flashed hot as a wave of dizziness seeped over him. He gripped the side of the platform and pulled half his body out, hacking and trying to breathe at the same time. Then he coughed so hard he spewed chunks on the platform. Caden took the rest of the day off. He told Eva what had happened, that his tank had run out of air, that he caught on a seashell and that he lost air for a short time. Eva was the original office manager of the park before the first closing. She had left her job at the jelly packing plant to come back and work for Martin when he reopened. Caden had learned in a short time that she liked box chocolates and strong coffee. Eva adjusted her bifocal glasses. Her brightly dyed red hair was piled on top of her head in a messy bun. Oh, I like messy buns. <laughs> uh, oh my gosh, Caden, you, you have to be more careful. You go home and rest. I'll let Martin know what happened. Thanks, Eva. She shook her head. I keep telling Martin we need more safety measures here. Maybe you shouldn't be diving by yourself. This shouldn't have happened. Nervous began to tingle in his chest. It's okay, Eva. I told Martin I could do this. I need this job. I can do it on my own. Okay, okay. Take care. You'll be in tomorrow, then. Yes, count on it. You're so responsible, Caden. You're a good boy. If I didn't have bad knees, I'd get up and give you a hug. She offered him a box. Uh, she offered him her box of chocolates instead. Here, have one. Chocolate always makes things better. I'm okay, thanks. He gave a small smile and left the office. The smile fell away as he walked into his car. Caden was in uneasy. He knew he filled the air tank the last time he'd used it. This time, as he put away his equipment and filled the air tank, he checked the spare. It was nearly empty as well. Could someone have let the air out on purpose? But why? Had someone been diving into the mech aquarium after hours? His cell phone rang. Roy. News travelled fast around the park. He didn't answer. He needed some time to think things over. He thought about working on a project at home, his comfort zone. But instead, he drove to the town bakery and picked up a couple donuts for Grams. It was late afternoon and she might be in the resident community area if, he was, if she was feeling up to it. He'd come to find out that, her, that with her Alzheimer's, she had good days and bad days. Days she was quiet and peaceful, and days that she wanted to bicker with someone she came across. And then there were days that were somehow both good and bad. When he entered her nursing room, Caden smelled cleaning chemicals and others, uh, and others' smells better not described. Elderly individuals were rolling through the hallways in wheelchairs. Some walked with a walker. Others were sitting in chairs in the hallways, taking a nap. He didn't find Grams in her room, so he strolled to the community room, and there she was, sitting in her wheelchair and watching the other residents play a board game. Grams had been a crafter when he was growing up, always knitting or crocheting, but as her Alzheimer's set in, she lost interest in crafting, or had forgotten how to do it. The last year, she'd begun to walk around the house, rummaging through her old magazines and newspapers. She'd stare out the window, looking at neighbours walk by and claim people were watching her, spying on her, telling stories about her. Why would she mumble to herself? Uh, sorry. She would mumble to herself and slowly lost interest in her projects. She was the one who had told him to do something with his idle hands when he was little. To create, to fix, to build. It broke his heart to see her now doing nothing when creating something had brought her so much joy. He smiled. Hi, Grams. How are you doing? Grams looked up. She frowned at him for nearly a minute, then smiled. Caden, my boy, you came to see me. Yes, I got off early today and could make it during visiting hours. He rolled her chair over to a settee and sat across from her. How are you feeling? She shrugged a thin shoulder. So-so. My leg still hurts from when I broke it. Her blue eyes were wide. Her pale skin sagged on her thin face. She fingered her crocheted blanket on her lap with her gnarled, skinny fingers. How are you? Did you find a job? She asked him absently, not meeting his eyes. So she remembered. Yeah, I work at Freddy's Fantasy Water Park now. She scowled. That place is closed. Don't lie to your grams. He smiled. It reopened a few weeks ago, and I just started. It's been good. Oh, really? She asked, but somehow managed to stare out at the room and seem disinterested. That was how most of, this, most of his conversations with her went nowadays. I got your favourite, a maple donut. 
He reached into the bag and then handed it to her. She licked her dry lips. That looks good. She took the donut and bit into it and chewed. Do I still have my house? Caden took out a double chocolate. Yes, everything is being taken care of. Don't you worry, Grams. How? Do you have a job? Grams didn't have much of a short-term memory. Yeah, I, I got hired at a water park in town. Then her eyes widened even more. With the water animatronics? No, no, Caden. You can't work there. You can't. It's okay, Grams. I'm handling it. You don't like things in the water. So scared since you lost your mum and dad. My Cynthia. I miss my Cynthia. Me too. He started on his donut to quench the sadness. Grams pointed with her donut. That water park, something strange about it, I remember. Caden tilted his head. What do you mean? Story there. Strange one. Mystery. Grams had gotten an avid gossip out of her life and had worked at the counter of an old hobby shop that had long ago gone out of business. She'd read the local newspaper every day and watched the late news every night. She'd go to all the community events and mingled with neighbours and townspeople, finding out the local gossip before most people. What kind of story, Grams? What kind of mystery? She took another bite of donut, staring at the room. Strange. She muttered again. Caden tried again. Grams, do you remember any stories about the water park? Grams didn't answer. I'm tired now. I think I'll go take a nap. Can I take a nap? Sure, okay. I'll get someone to help you. Caden asked the nursing assistant if she could help Grams back to her room to rest. He watched Grams as she was wheeled away, wishing for the days when she was clear-minded and strong. He realised he would never have her that way again. He exited the nursing home and got in his car. He sat for a moment, going over the day in his mind. He felt exhausted and the donut wasn't sitting well in his upset stomach. Then he remembered the rock. He dug it out of his pocket. It was thin and narrow. He rubbed at the built-up dirt with his thumb. He looked at the edges and saw they were slightly rounded. He stared at it and stared. Something was off. Then it hit him. This wasn't a rock. It was a small bone. He sucked in a breath as the bone dropped from his fingers. Ha <laughs> ha uh, <laughs> It was night at the water park, and it was much more crowded than usual. There were people walking around, families talking and laughing. People were, I, eh, people were eating popcorn, pizza and ice cream. Yet there were no lights on. Everyone was shadowed in the dark. Kids were in the line to ride Chica's ferry boats, and others walked up to the stairs to Foxy's Island water slides. People were playing games. Eerie carnival music steamed through the speakers. What's going on? He whispered. Where are the lights? Someone bumped against him. The person wore a Freddy Fazbear costume. The darkened, furry face stared at him. Kanan jerked back and walked away through the crowd. He looked at the centre of the park, at the Mech Aquarium. It was the only attraction that was lit up with bright lights. All the sea creatures were swimming around, fast. Usually they swam at a slower pace, but it was like these animatronics were alive, thriving, eager, trapped in an aquarium that was too small for their energy. Standing around the mech aquarium of the maintenance walkways were a bunch of little kids, smiling and pointing the glass. Hey, they aren't supposed to be there. The mech aquarium is off limits. Caden ran toward the maintenance entrance and saw all the kids surrounding the tank. The animatronics swam quickly next to the glass, staring at the children. The sea creature's eyes seemed bigger than normal, as if they were possessed. The sea dragon was the biggest, with the longest tail. The dragon's paint was bright green as if it was brand new. Its huge jaw opened and snapped closed. Many of the kids cheered, hitting the glass of the mech aquarium. Don't hit the glass, Kanan called out, but no one listened. Kanan noticed a couple of little kids climbing up the ladder toward the platform. No, Kanan yelled at them. You can't go up there, get down. He rushed toward the ladder, but it was like the crowd of children grew bigger blocking his way to the ladder. He tried to push through them, but they started to grab at his shirt and arms. I have to stop them. They could get hurt. Please, stop. Then he saw Martin and Roy standing around the tank, staring at the animatronics. He saw Eva too. They all watched as the little kids jumped up to the platform. Boss, Roy, stop the kids. They're making their way onto the top of the platform. They could get hurt. Martin and Roy simply grinned pointing at Delilah and Frank the diver inside the large aquarium. It was like they couldn't hear him. 
Roy let out his snorting laugh. Martin flashed his bright grin. Eva kept stuffing chocolates into her mouth. Kanan's head whipped up as suddenly little kids jumped from the platform into the tank, one by one. Kanan's eyes widened as panic crashed over him. Oh no! He shoved through the little kids toward the ladder. His breaths were short and fast. He had to stop them. He had to save them. But the closer he tried to get to the ladder, the further he seemed to be. It didn't make any sense. He watched as the animatronics started to speed toward the kids like animals after their prey. The sharks and serpents rushed toward the top of the tank as the little kids kicked and waved their arms at the top of the water. The sea dragon reared back its head like a snake and darted between the sharks and serpents, biting into a child's leg. Kanan felt his face flash cold, then hot. Red blood spilled into the water like a cloud of liquid. Oh, I love that line. The animatronics attacked the children. The sharks body slammed the kids and then rushed back to bite them. The mermaid grabbed a little kid's arm and tore it off. The diver grabbed a child by the leg and pulled him under. More blood spread through the water. Caden shouted in protest, tears stinging in his eyes. Someone grabbed him, turned him. It was his mother and father. Their faces were pale and discoloured, bloated. They were dead. The end. So this is a good... St no, I'm joking, that's not the end. Caden <laughs> uh, jerked awake, screaming. His heart pounded a mile a minute. He was shaking. He shoved off the covers and sat up. No, no, no. Yes, it was a dream. <laughs> uh, the next morning, the house phone rang. Caden blinked groggily as he tied his shoes. Who could be calling this early? He murmured, then yawned. He tossed and turned the rest of the night, afraid to go back to sleep after the nightmare. His eyes felt heavy. He'd taken a shower already, but it hadn't woken him up much. He pushed off his bed and walked to the phone in the kitchen and answered. Hello? I'm calling for Stella Barnes. I don't know who this is. Oh, I know who this is. Wait, never mind. I'm calling for Stella Barnes. Caden ran his hand through the top of his hair. Um, she's in a nursing home. Are you next of kin, her guardian? Um, yeah, I'm her grandson. She proceeded to tell him that Grams needed a ton of verification papers to continue her medical insurance. Caden wrote everything down on a notepad, trying to concentrate. Wait, when do you need this by? Well, she missed the deadline, so we need them faxed or emailed ASAP, or we'll discontinue her coverage. No, please. C can you grant her an extension? I'll get them to you as fast as I can. I promise. It's been a crazy month. I'm... Oh, oops. Uh, she agreed to one more week, and then Caden thanked her and hung up the phone. Great. Important papers. He looked around the kitchen, but he knew that wasn't where Grams kept her important stuff. He walked down the hallway to her bedroom and opened the door. The room smelled musty from being closed up for a month. Not only that, but newspapers and magazines were stacked in several areas of the room, along with spools of yarn and knitting needles. Her bed was made with a burgundy knitted blanket. Her pillows were still fluffed and smoothed out. He went to Graham's dresser that was piled with papers and envelopes. He hoped he could find her important papers in all of her chaos. He looked in the mirror and noticed dark circles under his eyes. His brown hair was getting a little long and he needed a haircut. He scraped at his jaw. He didn't really have much facial hair yet. He just looked tired from a bad night's, a bad night's sleep. He decided he would grab some coffee on the way to work. He pushed aside past medical statements on the surface of her dresser, even some old articles from years ago. Why Grams kept all of these, he didn't know. Then he started to read the headlines. Bear attack in Meadow Brook. Triplets born on St. Patrick's Day. Local couple lost at sea. Caden hesitated. He lifted the picture with the headline, seeing his mom, dad, and himself in a grainy family photo. They looked happy and peaceful. He rubbed at his stinging eyes. He often wondered how his life would have been if his parents had made it back from that boat trip or had decided not to go at all. He would have been raised by two loving parents. His life would, would have been so much happier. He wouldn't have been such an outsider his entire life. But most of all, he would have his mum and dad. It was the headline underneath that one that caught his eye. Missing local boy. Five-year-old Jason Butterfield had gone missing from his home over 20 years ago. 
the family had gone to Freddy's Fantasy Park that day and returned home, but the next morning, the little boy was just gone. The parents were distraught. They had no idea if he was taken in his sleep or if he'd run away. His bedroom window had been left open. Jason had been last seen wearing a blue sweatshirt, blue jeans, and white tennis shoes. Caden was suddenly wide awake. <laughs> uh, I have to go back to work, so I'm going to cut here. So, bye. <laughs> okay, I am back, and we are getting back into this. Uh, yes, it is a few hours later, but we don't talk about that. Uh, as Caden made his daily rounds at the park, his mind was whirling. It could be, just be a coincidence about the missing boy and his white tennis shoes. A coincidence that he was last seen at home after visiting Freddy's Fantasy Water Park earlier that day. All coincidence? Maybe. Mm, maybe not. And he'd taken the newspaper clipping to his bedroom and pinned it on his wall. Then he grabbed some of Graham's post-it notes and started writing down a couple of clues. Old, small tennis shoe. Zeus's mouth. Small finger bone, sea rock. He'd forgone the coffee and instead went to the local library before work and researched bones on the internet. The bone he'd found was similar to the shape of a finger bone. Caden wasn't sure what these clues would unearth, but he was willing to do a little secret investigating to find out. He couldn't go pointing fingers, no pun intended, when he wasn't sure what had happened to Jason Butterfield. Martin had given him a chance with this job and he wouldn't make accusations without more evidence. He wasn't even certain the bone was real. Could it be a prop from the park? Was it part of a fake skeleton? Wazowski! Oh, Wazowski? <laughs> oh, that's amazing. You, you don't read an audiobook for like a few hours and then you completely forget the names. And I was just like, Wazowski? No, this isn't Mike Wazowski, this is Wachowski. Wachowski! Kanan jerked off of his reverie and uh, spun around to see Martin Copper stalking toward him. Boss? Are you alright? What happened yesterday? I thought I told you to always check your air tanks and equipment. Martin hadn't told him anything actually, but Kanan always checked his equipment each day, except yesterday. Um, I forgot to check the air tank before I got in. Martin stopped in front of him and rubbed the back of his neck. Gosh darn it, kid. You gotta be more careful. But I had checked it the day before. What? I checked the tank the day before and filled it up. I always do. Martin waved a dismissive hand. You must have forgot. It happens. Caden didn't disagree, even though he knew he'd filled the tank. Martin sighed. Look, if you can't do the job... Nerves tightened his stomach. I can do the job, boss. It was just a mishap. Won't happen again, I promise. Fine, fine. I'm just glad you're okay. But I gotta be straight with you. If any other accidents happen, you're out, kid. I need employees who know what they're doing. I can't be having accidents from being careless. I got a business to run. I do. I mean, I know what I'm doing, boss. Hope so, kid. But he looked at him like he didn't believe him. Just take it easy, will ya? Then he walked away. Roy approached him next. Caden, you okay? Why didn't you answer my calls? Caden pushed a hand through his hair. Yeah, I'm fine. I had to visit my grams and then I just went home to rest. Sorry I didn't get back to you. Roy knocked him playfully on his shoulder with his fist. Just wanted to make sure you were okay, buddy. Caden smiled. Thanks, I'm alright. Hey, Roy? Yeah? You need help with something? No, um, did you ever hear about that missing boy, Jason Butterfield? Roy's eyes widened in surprise. You mean, from years ago? Yeah, everybody knew. He went to my school. It was all anyone talked about when it happened. Caden's eyebrows lifted. You knew him? Roy shrugged his round shoulders. We weren't best friends or anything, but yeah, we all played games on the playground. I remember everyone being sad at school. The town got a little freaked out. People were looking at each other funny. Then time went on. Jason never came home. The Butterfields moved away, never to be heard from again. I think maybe he ran away and then who knows what. Do you think he could have snuck back here? I heard he'd visited the park earlier that day with his family. Roy squinted his eyes at him. Where'd you hear all this? Why are you asking questions about it now? That was so long ago. 
Kenan felt Roy's suspicion bore into him. Um, my grams mentioned it when I told her I worked here. He nodded with a smile. Ooh, yeah, imagine your grams had gotten all the details back then. She liked to know things. Uh, look, I gotta go check out the booths. Then he pointed at Caden. Be sure to take care of yourself in the tank. Roy walked off, whistling. Caden frowned. Did Roy sound strange when he warned Caden about the tank? Then he dismissed the idea. But the conversation had confirmed a growing suspicion. Caden was beginning to think that Jason Butterfield hadn't run away at all. Since he'd found a white tennis shoe in Zeus's mouth and a small bone that had been embedded into a rock in the tank, he was beginning to think that the little boy had fallen into the mech aquarium and died, and no one had known. Then his stomach tightened. Or someone had known, and kept it a secret. Caden checked all the levels of the pools and mech aquarium in the water park. He'd watered down the slides and set up all the water areas right before the doors opened for the day. There was nothing on his, on his list to fix for once, so he walked into the workshop. He flicked on the lights, closed the heavy door, and scanned the metal shelves lined throughout the large area. The shelves stood against three walls of the room, and there were two pathways formed by more metal shelving. The shelves were filled with various objects that kept the park as clean and spruced up as possible. There were old metal pieces to picnic tables. One ferry boat was stashed in the corner because it had several holes in its bottom. One shelf was filled with remnants of old Freddy, Chica and Foxy costumes. There were large tools and small tools, boxes of screws and nails, old tubs of paint and paintbrushes, scrubbers, rags, brooms and mops. And all the way against the back wall was Caden's work table with a defunct squid animatronic sprawled out and covering the entire table. Above it were tools suspended on the walls with hooks and nails. The squid was a faded orange and one of the smaller animatronics. One tentacle was missing, its eyes were discoloured and one was cracked. And, of course, the motor was broken. Caden had fiddled with it a few times. First, to understand the motor of the animatronics in the mech aquarium, and second, to try to get it up and running again. He pulled out his work phone and set it on the table in case someone called, then picked up some needle nose pliers to pull a frayed wire from the squid. His mind kept veering back to the missing boy, to the shoe and the bone. While he wanted to believe the bone could be fake, his gut told him that it was indeed real, and that knowledge made him nervous. Jason Butterfield was lost just like his parents, and he wasn't sure how he felt about that. Suddenly the workshop went completely dark. Caden spun around. Hello? I'm in here. Please don't turn the lights off. No response. Caden frowned. How are the lights turned off? Did someone flick off the light switch? Uh-oh, is there a power outage across the entire park? He wondered. Is someone in here? He called out once more to be certain and set the pliers down. Then he felt the edge of the table as his eyes hadn't adjusted to the darkness. He shuffled beside the work table to try to get either to a flashlight or to the door. He couldn't remember where he'd set down the flashlight the last time he'd been in the shop. He sighed and slowly made his way along the side of the room, grabbing onto the shelves for guidance. Then he heard a sound, a shifting. Did someone just move? Hello? Is someone in here? Roy, is that you? He called out. No answer. Goosebumps raised along his arms. Look, this isn't funny. The boss isn't going to like it if you're playing games. Then he shook his head. He was probably talking to himself. There was likely no one in the workshop with him. It must be his imagination playing tricks on him. He touched the shelf, guiding himself the best he could. His finger nicked something sharp. Ow! He felt warmth on his finger. He'd cut himself. Dang it, he couldn't see anything and he'd forgotten his phone behind him. He'd better go back and get it. He could call Eva to find out if there was a power outage. He shifted back the way he came and thought he heard something else. Was someone taking a breath? Then he heard a loud creak. Caden's eyes widened. He didn't know what it was, but he rushed toward his phone. A crash filled the room and a whiff of air rushed across him. Caden's adrenaline spiked as pieces of metal rolled on the floor. What happened? Sudden light from outside rushed into the front of the workshop. Someone had opened the door. 
Hey, who's there? The light was enough to reveal a huge mess inside the workshop. One of the metal shelves from the center of the room had fallen over. The shelf had collapsed against another shelf on the wall and was leaning diagonally. A bunch of metal pieces and tools were spilled on the floor. Caden swallowed hard. The heavy shelf may have landed right where Caden had just been. Ooh, someone's trying to kill him. I think. I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't really remember the rest of the story, to be honest. So, uh, just from the summaries, of course. I mean, the last time I read this was like two months ago, so, yeah. Bolt them down, Wachowski. I want them all bolted down, Martin demanded in the now fully lit workshop. I can't be having any more accidents. After the shelf fell and Caden turned on the lights, he'd called the office to inform Eva what had happened, banished his cut finger, and proceeded to clean up the mess. Martin and Roy had rushed over to see if Caden was okay. Roy had helped him lift the heavy shelf upright. Caden realised that if it had landed on his head, he would have been done for. Whoa, buddy, if this had landed on you, squash! Roy echoed his thoughts with a clap off his thick hands. You're lucky. Gosh darn it, Wachowski. How the heck did this happen? What were you doing in the dark? Had you leaned on the shelf earlier? Martin stared at him, his hands on his hips, demanding answers. How many times have I told you to be more careful? What did I tell you if you had another accident? Caden's stomach suddenly felt upset. He ran a hand over the top of his head. Um, it wasn't me, boss. Please don't fire me. Well, something happened here, and we're lucky you didn't get hurt. I warned you. Come on, boss, Roy said. Caden's a good kid. Give him another chance. I think someone turned off the lights and ran out, Caden blurted. He left out the accusation that someone may have pushed the shelf over, trying to hurt him, or worse. Martin pointed at him. Wait a darn minute, are you saying the pranks are starting up again? He began to pace the walkway. After all these years, the kids are back, causing me trouble. Roy, have you seen any kids sneaking around where they're not supposed to? Roy scratched the whiskers on his chin. Nah, boss, not that I've seen. Well, gosh darn it. Something's going on. I can feel it. It's the same feeling I got back in the early days. Weird pranks happening, and it's all starting again. Well, no one is going to best me this time. Not the kids. No one. Martin stormed out of the workshop, mumbling under his breath. Roy let out a whistle. <laughs> Boss is ticked. Do you think this is a prank, Roy? Roy frowned. Possible. You saw someone run out the door? Well, um, it suddenly opened after the shelf fell. So, the shelf could have fallen on its own from too much stuff on it? Roy was staring at him intently. What does he want me to say? Caden wondered. It was just a freak accident? He shook his head. Really, I'm just not sure. I think we tell the boss the truth. That you didn't see anyone, buddy. But he had heard someone, hadn't he? We want him to keep you on the job, right? Caden grabbed some more bolts from a box to drill into the cement floor. Yeah, I need this job. It's true. Didn't actually see anyone. Roy grinned. Good, that's settled. Gotta get back to the booths or I'd help you. Caden waved the drill. It's okay, I'm good. Thanks for trying to help me keep my job. Sure, buddy. What are friends for? Roy sauntered out of the door with a wave. Caden stared at the mess. Something was definitely going on. Was it just kids playing pranks, or was someone trying to stop him from finding out the truth about the Mech Aquarium and Jason Butterfield? With the workshop put back to rights and the shelves all bolted down for safety measures, Caden needed a break. He stood in line for a slice of pizza, his mind replaying the last week. First the air tanks had been emptied, and now he'd almost been smashed by a heavy shelf. He swallowed hard. Who could be causing these so-called accidents? Was it Roy? Was it Martin? Was it kids playing tricks? Or were they just freak accidents? A loud horn behind his head surprised him and caused him to whirl around, his adrenaline spiking. Then he was shot in the face by a continuous stream of silly string. The horn finally stopped, and so did the string. 
Caden pulled sticky string from his face. The first person he saw was Daryl, holding a loud horn in front of his face with a giant stuffed bonnie in the other arm. The next person he saw was the little girl, Marie, standing beside him, holding a can of neon yellow silly string. Daryl stepped backward, busting up laughing. The little girl was smiling because Daryl was laughing so hard. Great job, Marie. We played a funny trick on Wazowski, didn't we? I, ca I can't believe I keep saying Wazowski. If you, couldn't, if you couldn't tell, I actually did take another cut, but I didn't tell you. Uh, it is now my third day of work reading this book, and <laughs> oh my gosh, it's my lunch break again, so I'm going to try and get this finished now. Um, but I said w Wazowski again. I'm stupid. Uh, we played a funny trick on Wazowski, didn't we? Caden frowned, pulling off the rest of the silly string. Daryl, he said. Back again. Daryl finished snickering and took a deep, uh, big breath. Ah, uh, yeah. Well, little Marie takes this place for some reason. Or likes this place. I don't know why it takes. Yasmin's getting her some popcorn. We got you good, Wachowski. Just like the old days. Oh, that felt so awesome. Caden sighed, threw the wadded up string into a garbage can beside him. How long have you been here? For a couple of hours. Check out this giant bonnie I won for Marie. Got all three rings on the bottles. Bet you couldn't do it. Could Daryl be the one who had followed him into the workshop and tried to pull a shelf on him? One time, Daryl had sprained Caden's arm and given him a concussion when his pranks had gone too far. Of course, Caden had called them accidents when the teachers had asked him what had happened. Were you anywhere near the workshop here, Daryl? Daryl narrowed his eyes at him. What are you talking about, Wachowski? I'm talking about your stupid pranks. We're not kids anymore, so you'd better not be pulling any more tricks around the park. What? He asked, then rolled his eyes. Oh, even if I did, who's going to stop me? You. Ha, <laughs> yeah, right. I'm saying things can be dangerous around here and you shouldn't be playing around. We're not in school anymore. Daryl stepped up to Caden. This time, Caden was not intimidated. Daryl was just a bully who had always had to get his way to make himself feel good. Caden didn't back down. He just looked at Marie with her wide eyes as she watched them. He set a gentle hand on Daryl's shoulder and slightly nudged him back. Not in front of the little girl. Come on. Caden shook his head. Grow up, Daryl. I did. Look, I'm on lunch, and then I've got to get back to work. So why don't you show Marie a better example and go and have fun instead of wasting my time? Then he turned his back and went up to the, get his pizza slice. After a moment, he looked over to his shoulder to see Daryl had walked away without saying a word. Caden took a big breath. He felt that he was finally done with Daryl cunning him, bullying him. Good on Caden. Caden had tossed and turned all night, wondering what he should do about the Mech Aquarium and Jason Butterfield. He wondered if he should go to the police station and show them the clues he'd discovered and tell them all about the weird accidents happening to him at the park. And there he found himself that morning, right in front of Meadow Brooks' small police station, with a backpack slung over his shoulder, holding an old shoe and small finger bone. Oh my gosh, what am I doing? Even if he told the police what he suspected, would they even believe him? And, they, and then, if they started to investigate, Martin would surely fire him for cu causing him in the park trouble. He'd lose his income, he'd lose Graham's house, he'd be homeless. He really hadn't thought this through very well. He needed more time to think. He turned around and walked right into Police Chief Jackson. Whoa there, look who it is. Caden Wachowski. How you doing, son? Caden's eyes widened. Oh, hi, Chief Jackson. I'm good. Good. Chief Jackson had been the one to come to Graham's house to tell him his parents had been lost at sea. He'd been a patrol officer back then and had always been a kind man with dark skin and a gentle demeanour. Even though he was over six feet tall and would and could have been a professional wrestler, in Caden's opinion. What brings you to the police station? he asked it, Caden. Caden became nervous. He looked all around, trying to come up with a fib. Well, um, I thought I lost something, but I, um, found it and I'm good now, so thanks. He started to walk off. Hold up, son. How's your grandmother? Is she doing okay after her accident? Caden did his best to calm himself. It was just a kind man asking about his grandmother. He doesn't know you have a finger bone in your backpack. Yeah, she's doing better. Thanks, Chief Jackson. That's good to hear. He raised his thick eyebrows. You sure everything's okay? Yep. Caden forced a smile. Good and dandy. Heard you got a job at the water park. 
How's Martin Copper treating you? Good. I'm really thankful for the job. It's good there. Yep. The chief continued to eye him, then smiled. Okay then. You need anything? You just let me know. Don't be a stranger, Caden. Thanks. Bye, Chief Jackson. Caden quickly walked to his car and took off to work. He found himself in a really tricky situation, and he didn't feel it was time to go to the police. He needed more proof about the missing boy and Martin Copper's water park before he was willing to shake things up in his small town. It was near closing and Caden was sporadically keeping an eye on the mech aquarium, actually hoping for one of the animatronics to go down. Crazy, he knew. But he was looking for another excuse to dive in and look for more clues after the park was closed when most of the workers were gone for the day, except Roy, who was also the night security guard. Caden had been tracking Roy's routine and apparently his co-worker had a large pepperoni pizza every night with a litre of soda and two giant chocolate chip cookies, followed by a long nap in the front office. By the time the park closed its gates, Caden realised there would be no valid excuse to get back into the mech aquarium. He would have to dive in and secretly look for more clues, hoping Roy wouldn't notice. Could there be more bones hidden among the sea rocks? He wondered. He wanted to find out. He needed to. He was torn between what was right and what was wrong, and what he should do about it. The only way to know was to find something that gave him a clear, straightforward answer. He knew he'd find that answer in the mech aquarium. Caden watched Eva leave, and made his way up to the platform and then stood, scanning the park. He didn't see anyone lingering behind. He figured Roy was munching on his pizza right about now. He changed into his diving suit and double-checked his air tank. Yep, full and put on the rest of his equipment. He shut off the power to the animatronics and pushed the button to pull back the tarp. Miraculous, m miraculously, most of the animatronics had stopped in one end of the tank as if giving him a wide berth to explore. Huh, will you look at that, he murmured. My lucky day. He put on his goggles and slipped the breathing regulator into his mouth before he slipped into the chilled water. The strange static entered his mind as he dived down toward the bottom. He was nervous, of course but his need for answers pushed his usual phobia from his mind. Caden kicked out his legs until he reached the bottom. He ran his hands over rocks and shells, trying to see or feel if anything seemed odd or out of place. The little bone had been stuck to a rock, and he guessed that could be the case with other pieces of bone if, in fact, there were more bones to be found. Caden glanced over to the animatronics and blinked. All the sea creatures had turned in his direction, with Frank the Diver moving slightly closer. A chill crept down his back. Everything is okay, he told himself, as he forced himself to keep searching. There was just so much sea rock, discoloured shells, and fake kelp covering the mech aquarium floor. It could take him weeks to find another piece of evidence. He was about to call it a day, when his tank knocked, knocked against a chunk of rock. He turned around to make sure he didn't cause any damage, spotting a round rock wedged between a small space of sea rocks. It was covered with algae. Caden reached for the rock, and it came loose rather easily. He turned the rock around in his hands, and he flinched. The rock had two deep holes, with a smaller one underneath. It was a skull! It was a freaking human skull! He wanted to scream. He wanted to drop it and swim away, but he held on as his hands trembled. The bottom jaw of the skull had fallen off somewhere. If there was a finger and a skull, there was likely a body or more parts of a skeleton. He looked around the mech aquarium through the glass, making sure no one had seen what he found. What should he do? Should he leave it? Should he take it straight to the police, along with a finger bone? There was no denying it now. There was definitely human remains inside the mech aquarium. He had to do the right thing and notify the police that this could be Jason Butterfield's skull. In the next moment... A distant humming caught his attention. What was that? He looked up to see the tarp was closing over him. Caden kicked up toward the surface. The tarp was already halfway closed by the time he started swimming, and as he made his way to the top, the tarp closed shut over Caden, sealing the tank. He was trapped. <laughs> Caden's heartbeats pattered against his chest. The static in his ears seemed to grow louder. What could he do? How would he get out? He stuffed the skull into his tool pouch and took out his screwdriver. He reached at the tarp's edge and tried to pry at the stiff material, attempting to wedge the screwdriver into an opening, but there was no space to slip the tool into. He hit at the tarp, but it was pretty sturdy. Please, please, please get me out of here! His stomach began to turn. 
his mind clouded with too many thoughts. He whirled around, looking out of the mech aquarium's glass. Was Roy around? Could he see him? Could he last all night inside the tank? Would he have enough air to survive? No, he didn't think that would be possible. A movement below caught his attention. Caden shifted and his eyes went big. Frank the diver was slowly floating up toward him. Caden felt the panic rise within him. His arms waved around erratically, trying to get away as fast as he could from the animatronic. He kicked with his legs, swimming further away from the tank, the, the driver, the, the driver, the diver, and down into the tank. He swam as fast as he could, maneuvering beyond some rocks. Was the power to the animatronics turned on? He scanned the other sea creatures and saw that they were still unmoving. How was the diver moving on its own without any power? The arms of the diver began to wave and its legs kicked out toward Caden. Oh my gosh. This wasn't like when Zeus had floated toward him. The animatronic was swimming like a human instead of its slow, usual movements. And it was heading straight for Caden. Caden looked around. The only direction he could go was toward the animatronics, floating on the other side of the tank and still gathered on in a group. Uh, everything within him protested the idea of hiding behind them. But he had no choice. His stomach felt like it was swishing in a spin cycle as he swam toward a row of sharks, the mermaid and the serpents. Their eyes were staring directly at him. He looked behind, behind them. The diver was closer. Caden kicked out, reaching for Sly's fin, and pulled himself even further from the diver. Caden maneuvered around the shark. He swam past Delilah the mermaid, her hair tangled in front of his goggles. Caden shoved the hair away and glanced behind him. The diver was too close. Its hands reached for him. Help me! Help me! Someone help me! The diver was going to kill him. It was going to rip him apart like in his nightmare. Caden's vision began to blur. His body shook, trying to get away from the diver, from the mermaid, from the sharks and the serpents. The static in his ears grew louder. Caden thought his eardrums would burst. The diver caught his arm with one hand. Caden jerked back, but couldn't free himself. The diver's grip dug into his limb, digging into the bone, crushing him. He wanted to scream. Caden reached out to shove away the diver's arm, but it was like steel. He was going to die underwater. There was no one to help him. Caden struggled with the diver, trying to get away, but the animatronic was too strong. Bubbles of air surrounded them. The diver moved face to face with Caden. Caden looked into the tinted glass and saw nothing but darkness. The other hand of the diver tried to pull off Caden's breathing regulator. Shocked, Caden shifted his head away as they struggled. He shoved at the vintage suit, and he hit the metal helmet with a screwdriver still in his grip. Screwdriver. Caden started to bang at the helmet with the tool, then at the body, hoping it would somehow damage the animatronic and get it to stop. The diver's hand grabbed at Caden's throat and started to squeeze. No, no, no! Caden's air was starting to cut off. His eyes began to bulge. He shifted the screwdriver and dug into the neck of the diver's helmet and wedged hard into the suit with all his strength. He managed to pry up the helmet and water rushed inside. Caden dropped the screwdriver, gripping the edge of the helmet and pulled it up and completely off from the animatronic. The animatronic released him and Caden lurched back in stunned surprise. It wasn't an animatronic at all. Martin. <laughs> Martin was in the diver's suit. Martin had tried to kill him. His boss waved his arms around after, the air, after his air supply had been ripped from his head. Caden was frozen in disbelief. His mind was trying to catch up with the scene before him. Martin shifted toward him, and Caden tried to swim away, but Martin grabbed his leg. Caden kicked out, trying to get free, but Martin pulled him closer. Closer. Caden caught a moment in the water and turned his head to see Zeus. The sea dragon was moving toward them. Caden blinked. The dragon had come to life without power. In the next moment, the sea dragon slowly circled them and its long tail reached out and snaked around one of Martin's legs. Martin was wrenched to a stop. He looked back and discovered the sea dragon's tail had latched onto him. His eyes widened. He released Caden and began to flail around, screaming, swallowing in water. Air bubbles floated up from his mouth. Caden swam backward in horror as he watched the other animatronics guide, glide toward Martin. The mermaid's hair wrapped around Martin's head, covering his face. Martin shoved at the hair. The, the sharks and serpents moved in, surrounding Martin as he desperately tried to swim away. Caden was immobilized in terror. He watched the air bubbles disappear one by one. Then the animatronics floated away. The dragon released Martin's lifeless body, and it drifted through the water, his glassy eyes wide open. His mouth gaped, showing his vibrant teeth. 
Caden realised the static in his head had gone silent and Martin was dead. A week later, Caden walked into the gates of the closed Freddy's Fantasy Water Park. Eva had called him to pick up his last paycheck, but he didn't go straight to the office. He found himself walking toward the centre of the park, to the Mech Aquarium. Yellow police caution tape surrounded the large centre of attraction. The tank was halfway drained. The animatronics crowded together in the still water, flipped over and sideways. The serpents had gotten caught on taller sea rocks, where they now hung like dead fish. The police had sent professional divers in and broke apart the force structures, where they found small, hidden skeletal remains. Jason Butterfield had been identified by dental records. The police weren't completely certain what had transpired so many years ago but Jason had somehow drowned inside the mech aquarium, and Martin Copper had buried Jason's body under the rocks to cover it up. And he tried to stop J uh, Caden's discoveries by causing freak accidents, either hoping Caden would get hurt or quit snooping around so he wouldn't find out the truth. Apparently, Martin Copper had been in severe debt, and he didn't want anyone to discover the death of Jason Butterfield in his prized mech aquarium. Caden had been interviewed by police chief Jackson that very night, He'd handed over the clues he had found and told him about the accidents that had been happening to him and how Martin had tried to, to trap and strangle him. He couldn't quite explain how Martin had died. He did his best to describe that after their struggle, Martin had lost his air supply, that he somehow got stuck on the sea dragon and drowned. Caden also explained how he retrieved his screwdriver and ripped his way out of the tarp and how he did his best to pull Martin out of the tank, but the diver suit had been too heavy. When he managed to get Roy's help, call emergency services, and pull out their boss, Martin had been gone too long to be saved. It had all been over the local news, and been picked up by some big news circuits. Locals had been coming by bringing Caden casseroles, praising him for finding Jason Butterfield. Grams was calling him, asking him to come visit so she could hear the entire story from Caden himself. The news had somehow awakened uh, Grams' interest, and she was more alert for the time being. It had all been surreal, as if it were happening to someone else. Caden still wasn't sure what to think about everything and wasn't comfortable with the town's sudden interest. Hey there, buddy. Roy walked up to Caden. Caden nodded to his friend. Hey, Roy. Roy shifted on his big feet. Look, I'm sorry with what went down. If I had known that boss was trying to hurt you, Caden lifted a hand to stop him. Roy, it's okay. I wasn't even sure what was happening until I discovered Martin was inside the diver's suit. Well, I want you to know, and I know you're needing a job and all, and I'd love for you to come work for me when when you're up for it. Caden lifted his eyebrows. For you? Where? Roy stretched out his arms, his shirt lifted, revealing the bottom of his bloated belly. Welcome to Roy's Fantasy Water Park. <laughs> Caden's mouth opened, but no words came out. I bought the place from the bank of a steel, Roy said, clearly excited. Going to reopen it once everything is fixed. It's going to be just like it used to be when I was a kid, but way better. Roy tossed an arm around Caden's shoulders as they began to walk around the park, his other hand waving in the air as he described his plans. It'll be the best park anyone has ever seen. Live music, parades, Freddy, Chica and Bonnie will be back, greeting everyone in costumes, tons of food and candy. You wait and see. It'll be dynamite. What do you say? Are you in or are you in? He glanced at Caden when he didn't say anything. You're in. Right, buddy? <laughs> ah! <laughs> I love that. That was such a good story. Oh. Yeah, that's... I love that. It was really good. Um, So, the reason I love that so much... I don't know. That ending... That ending felt really different. It. I don't know why. It must have been like a, a tone that we haven't had before. But it was like an overview of what happened over the next week and like this is how everything is going positively you know his grams is getting better because like she's more aware of things uh roy has got his own water park now caden's doing great everybody's like crowding around him and like he's famous for saving jason butterfield everything's good uh and i really like that um it felt very nice uh, it kind of felt like a movie. I feel like a lot of these stories in these books are starting to feel like like movies. I feel like they probably take a lot of inspiration from movies as well. Um, and like I've re I've recently been watching the Two Knives Out films, and those are brilliant. Like they're like murder mysteries. And this I've kind of felt similar energy at the end there. I don't know why, but 
yeah, when when you got the reveal that it was Martin, I was like, oh, it was Martin the whole time. Uh, but yeah, really good story. Uh, I really like en enjoyed it. I really like it. Um, it is the weakest of this book, I would say, my personal opinion. But you haven't read the other two stories yet, so I'm not going to make you change your opinion on that, obviously. But it's it's still fantastic. Fantastic story. Uh, I absolutely love it. Uh, I've got nothing else to say on it, really, apart from the fact that, first of all, I did mention there are multiple mega pizza plexes. And secondly, the other thing I completely forgot to mention, which I remembered literally coming here and recording, is the fact that in the newspaper that Grams was reading or whatever, it did say that there was a bear that attacked something or whatever. But bears are extinct in security breach, which means that this has to be before security breach. I know that's a really odd detail, but yeah. That's that's a funny detail there that uh, might help with timeline placement. I'm going to make a timeline soon anyway, um, so watch out for that. Anyway, the next story we are reading is Animatronic Apocalypse, and that is my favourite story of all time, so you are in for a massive treat. Anyway, I will see you then. Thank you for listening, and goodbye.